Good morning, Hungary. My name is Piotr Gwaska, and it's a true honor for me to start first session at Besides Budapest 2021. I'm based in Poland, and for last four years, I've been working for Infoblox, which is secure DNS vendor. And during these four years, I've been analyzing different malware, phishing campaigns, different malicious activities under just one angle how the attackers were using DNS system, DNS protocol itself in their malicious uh, activities. And today I would like to present you a short summary uh, of, of this research. So let's start. Why we are talking about DNS in, in cybersecurity? Because basically just as most of good programs, also malware, almost uh, always is using somehow DNS. Uh, if we would uh, look at cyber kill chain model, uh, there are several phases of infection. So everything starts with a reconnaissance where attacker is trying to get as many information as possible about the victim, victim infrastructure, IP addresses they are using, systems they are using, applications, everything possible, which makes uh, the attack easier later. Uh, at this stage, attacker is usually using DNS to gather information from, for example, passive DNS about host names, which sometimes can reveal applications uh, used by the victim. They gather information such as uh, IP addressing used by the, uh, by the victim company. Uh, then they uh, go into weaponization phase where they prepare the malware, they prepare the tools they will be using. In terms of DNS, usually they, uh, they need to register some domain names. Um, they need to set up maybe C2 servers, which will be using DNS, uh, prepare the malware itself. Then there is a delivery phase when the malware is actually delivered to the, to the victim. Uh, Usually it's a form of the email. This email can contain attachment. It can contain a link. Uh, it doesn't have to be an email. It could be an advertisement on some social media uh, with some malicious uh, URL. Uh, usually when um, there is a link in the email on in the advertisement, it's uh, given as a fully qualified domain name, uh, not as an IP address. and in this, uh, in this moment, when the user is clicking this link, there is a first possibility also for a DNS system to protect the user because malicious domain names could be blocked. And that's the most simple way how people think how DNS can protect uh, users. Then uh, there is an uh, exploitation phase where uh, some vulnerabilities are, are exploited on the victim systems. Um, in terms of DNS, that could be, for example, DNS protocol anomaly, so a specially crafted packet which would cause some actions on the server side or on the client side. Uh, also, domain hijacking, uh, which could be you know made easier because sometimes people forget to set good passwords, so DNS registrars. Sometimes they don't use multi-factor authentication and so on. Then we have an installation phase where the malware is actually installed in the victim computer. And then DNS is not used at this phase rather much. The most interesting phase, uh, specifically from DNS protocol perspective is a command and control phase, C2. Because DNS is used at this phase in a different ways. First, usually the C2 address uh, is given or set fixed in, in the malware as a fully qualified domain name. Um, it's about 80% of the malware um, that is using DNS names as a C2 server addresses. The other 20 is just using plain IP addresses. Uh, when attacker is using just IP addresses, uh, he is that when someone will not notice that the IP address is malicious, it will be easily blocked on the firewall. And then the, you know, the whole work which was done by the attacker will be lost. So this reconnaissance, time lost on reconnaissance, on preparing weapons and so on. So usually they prefer to use uh, the main name 
which allows them to easily change IP addresses in case one would be blocked. There are several other algorithms uh, such, as, such as DGA, domain generation algorithms, because it can happen that the domain name can also be blocked, but then. So there are several algorithms to overcome this possibility. The whole command and control communication uh, can also be hidden uh, inside of DNS queries and DNS answers. So we will go through real examples later. I will show you how this is, this is done. Then the last phase is actions on objectives where actually the attacker is trying to get what he actually did the attack for. So maybe he wanted some sensitive data, maybe he wanted to cause denial of service, uh, maybe he want to get the ransom, maybe he just want to disturb some activities of the victim. In case of uh, data leakage, so if, if attacker wanted to get some sensitive information, uh, DNS could be potentially used to transfer this data out of the victim's network in a very hard to actually hard to detect uh, way. Uh, also, in case of the DOS, of, of course, uh, denial of service, DNS is a great protocol, unfortunately, uh, to be used uh, to, to, to cause such um, unavailabilities of, of the system, because if DNS doesn't work, basically nothing is working. Let's look at this last phase and let's look how actually data can be stolen uh, with uh, help of DNS protocol. So let's assume attacker is already in the network. Uh, he has communication with the C2 server from the C2 server to the uh, infected endpoint. And he has some data uh, to be exfiltrated or stolen from the victim's network. Uh, to do that, before he started the attack, actually, he needs to register a domain name one or more domain names and set up authoritative servers for these domain names. This means when, whenever there will be a DNS query for any host in such domain name, this query will finally reach the attacker's DNS server. Then when he is in the last phase of the, of the infection in this um, uh, uh, phase where he's already in, he takes the data he wants to steal he might optionally encrypt it before sending. Then he needs to encode the data. He needs to encode it because the data will be sent inside of the DNS query itself, and it will be stored somewhere in a fully qualified domain name. It could be stored as a host name or a subdomain name, but anyway, it's always in FQDN, which means data needs to comply to the RFC or the encoded data needs to uh, comply to the RFCs, which are uh, describing how DNS query is built, how fully qualified domain name is built. There are some limits like, you know, FQDN altogether can have 255 characters with dots included. Uh, there can be only letters, uh, digits, a dash and underscore sign and it's case insensitive. So some kind of encoding needs to take place before we build such queries. It could be a hexadecimal encoding because these are just you know 10 digits and six letters, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, so it complies the RFC. It could be base uh, 32 encoding, it could be base 64, uh, usually with some modifications. Later, after the um, uh, attacker has encoded the data, he needs to cut this data into, into chunks because the limit between the dots in the name is 63 characters. So it needs to be cut in the chunks, which should be shorter than 63 characters. Usually it's actually much shorter. Then after the query is built, it is sent from the infected endpoint to local DNS resolver of the victim company. So it is not usually sent to the C2 server directly. No, uh, attacker is sending this query to the local DNS resolver. And this DNS resolver looks at the query. It's completely you know, RFC compliant. So basically it sends uh, this query out to the internet. And finally, it will reach uh, attacker's DNS server authoritative for his 
domain name, for example, here cornpane.pw. So here also attacker is uh, using this characteristic of, of DNS that basically it, it's kind of a proxy communication. Wherever the endpoint will send a query to uh, DNS resolver, this resolver is not just forwarding this query, like you know, passing it through, it will build a new query. And as a source IP of this query will use its own IP address. So IP address of the endpoint will be actually replaced with the IP address of the DNS server. So imagine even if the infected endpoint does not have internet connectivity, but can send a DNS query to this local resolver, then actually this query will uh, possibly it can reach the internet, right? Even the, if the endpoint does not have direct internet connection. So the DNS here is actually working as a multi-hop proxy because even in between can be more DNS servers. For example, local DNS a resolver will send a query to ISP of this uh, company or maybe to some open resolvers, such as Google or Cloudflare whatever, and then finally it will reach the attacker's DNS server. Uh, how does it look in reality? Here we have an example of Alina Post malware, which is a malware um, uh, affecting a point of sale system. And this malware is trying to steal credit card data information. Here are example queries used by Alina POS. Uh, they are quite long, as you see. Um, because it's quite simple malware, so attackers are not really afraid of being detected. They um, target some companies with quite low cybersecurity uh, protections. Uh, let's look at this uh, second query. Let's cut the hostname part and subdomain part and try to decode the data. Uh, I will do that in the CyberChef tool. Uh, here, as you see, I have copied the the domain, the DNS query without the final uh, domain name. And let's try to decode it. So because we see here uh, upper and lower case, we can assume this is uh, probably base64 encoding here. And standard base64 cannot be used because it is using plus and slash signs. So basically, uh, usually attackers are using an URL safe version of base64, which is replacing those characters with dash and underscore. So let's use this one. Uh, we still don't see human readable data. So let's try something simple because as I said, it's quite simple malware. For example, uh, XOR. Since we don't know which, which key is used here, um, let's use a brute force capability of CyberChef and check the different values for different key values. Uh, let's move it a little bit. Maybe I'll make it a bit slow, smaller. Oh, no, maybe it will be better. And uh, here for the AA key, actually we can decode the data. So we see here a unique identifier of uh, infected endpoint. It is needed because, as I said, its IP address is actually replaced, so it's lost in the transmission. So if the attacker wants to know from which host he gets the queries, he gets the data, he needs to somehow uh, set unique identifier of this host and put this ID inside of the DNS query itself. Uh, then we have a computer name of this infected cost. Uh, here we have a process uh, name, the process which is uh, processing credit card data information. And here we have a credit card number and uh, expired date of this, of this credit card. So the data is actually encoded in a very simple way. Uh, even more you know, funny is that this AA key is used by Alina Post uh, since 2013, because this malware is quite old, but originally it was using HTTP to exfiltrate data. And in recent years, they switched to DNS, but actually they still use the same XOR key. So this is uh, how it looks uh, in a simple malware. Mm. How about more uh, advanced cases? For example, uh, TrickBot. So TrickBot is a, um, a group and the malware family is actually 
uh, which is modular. So it can do different, uh, different things. Uh, it can, uh, for example, load uh, uh, a malware, which will be later doing DDoS attacks. It could be a ransomware module. Uh, or if they have no customer for the computer which they infected, maybe they will just uh, mine crypto cryptocurrency. So there are several uh, options. One of the quite interesting variants of TrickBot is uh, named Anchor DNS. It was prepared for kind of premium customers of the TrickBot group. Uh, and it was installed when the TrickBot uh, has successfully infected computers uh, in financial sector or high impact servers such as Active Directory controllers. Normally TrickBot is using HTTPS as a C2 protocol, but imagine if you have an Active Directory controller and you would uh, notice that this computer is connecting some unknown addresses over HTTPS on the internet, then it would be suspicious. On the other hand, usually Active Directory controller is um, having a Microsoft DNS on it, and it is set as a default resolver for all the computers in the company. So it is processing a huge numbers of DNS queries to different domainings. So it is receiving the queries, it is sending them to the internet, getting the replies and so on. So when they do C2 over DNS, then this traffic will be actually hidden in this huge number of DNS packets. So it will be a lot more complicated um, to, to detect this C2 communication. So this is uh, why they decided to go with C2 over DNS in this case. And here you have some example of DNS query, encoded data here. And here you can see decoded data, for example, uh, a campaign name, host name, client ID, and then the content, so the data itself. Very advanced use of uh, C2 over DNS uh, could be seen in uh, Dark Hydra's group actions uh, because the communication they are using over DNS is highly randomized. So, for example, uh, imagine the hostname part contains some encoded data. Normally, most of the malware will use a fixed length uh, data. In their case, Every query, they were actually randomizing the uh, hostname part. It was uh, chosen between 30 to 43 characters. So every time it was a little bit different. So it was you know, a little bit more difficult to, to detect with some simple signatures. Also, please note that this is not very long. It's just 30 to 43 characters. So it's completely different than Alina POS. Alina POS was having like a very long query and they were not afraid uh, of detection. Here, it's an advanced group attacking government agencies. They try to build queries which will be average on size. Usually, the size of DNS query is somewhere around 60 to 100 characters. So here, they get 30 to 43 plus at the domain name. And altogether, it is more or less average domain name query. Uh, also, the delay between the queries was quite long, uh, around three seconds. And it was not fixed three seconds, it was randomized. So it was usually between 2.4 to 3.6 seconds. They were also randomizing query types. So not always asking about one query, although this model could work like that, but also they could just you know, randomly check, uh, select a query type for each uh, query. The domain names which were used, also it was not just one domain name, but each query was choosing randomly a domain name uh, from a set of a uh, dozen domain names. So it was not like, you know, that you have a host which is sending a lot of queries to single domain name. So it's quite suspicious. But here now there were a bunch of different domain names and they were changed. So quite, quite interesting uh, approach. Uh, even more interesting case was uh, is, is using the bad WPAT attack. Um, WPAT means Web Proxy Auto Discovery. And basically, it's a protocol used by, uh, for example, Windows systems when they need to uh, automatically detect which web proxy the, the Windows should use. 
And this detection is uh, based uh, partially on the DNS system. The endpoint is asking for a host called WPAT. And then uh, the domain name is added from the search suffix list from the Windows uh, network configuration. So usually it's something like, you know, wpad.company.hu, for example. If this name is, a, a, is not found, um, depending on the Windows configuration, Windows might skip the company part and it will ask uh, for wpad.hu domain name, right? So what is possible is that someone will register such domain names such as wpad.hu, wpad. I don't know, top or whatever. Uh, whatever victim uh, is using as a top level domain name. And then Windows is actually asking for a file which, is contain, which should contain web proxy configuration. So there should be an answer which proxy to use for specific URL. Uh, so imagine someone is registering such domain name and if the company, victim company does not have this WPAT entry, then basically the Windows possibly could reach to attacker's server and ask for the file with web proxy configuration. Then the attacker will be glad to help and give this file with the configuration, but in the file, it will direct the um, endpoint, victim's endpoint to malicious web proxy, for example. Uh, Adam Jaya, which wrote the blog, uh, which you can see at the bottom, uh, had uh, done some research and checked different top level domain names uh, if uh, WPAT entry exists there. And for example, he found a very interesting case of um, WPAT.software domain name, uh, which was serving a web proxy file, uh, which was actually instructing the browser to encode an, a URL which user is browsing uh, in base64 and then exfiltrate this URL to the attacker over DNS query. So it was he was not like you know the attacker was not uh, redirecting all the traffic uh, to the malicious web proxy. Actually he was redirecting HTTP and uh, FTP traffic, but encrypted traffic uh, because of the certificate problems was not redirected only the URL was exfiltrated over DNS. So very interesting case of uh, bad WPAT attack. The most advanced attack I have seen, uh, and probably most of us, it's Sunburst. Uh, and in Sunburst attack, so the one uh, where the um, supply chain problems were, were basically exploited in uh, an infection over SolarWinds uh, software, uh, the first phase of command and control was used uh, over DNS. Uh, the, in the first phase, Sunburst actually infected something like 18,000 computers. And because it, the first phase was meant to you know, do such a wide infection, they really care to not generate a lot of traffic and a lot of suspicious traffic. So they decided to use DNS. DNS was used to first uh, register infected computer in the C2 server. So say, hey, infection was successful. I mean, what's next? And over DNS queries, um, they also send information about internal corporate domain name of the victim because they didn't want to infect all these 18,000 computer, uh, 18,000 companies. They actually targeted some, you know, most important organizations such as some ministries, government institutions, and some other important companies. So they needed um, a way to find out in which company they are. They choose to, to check uh, internal corporate domain name. And this name was exfiltrated to the C2 server over DNS queries. They decided to just uh, send 14 letters uh, of a domain name in a query. And if these 14 letters would be not enough, they would just ask uh, to send more, to send another 14 letters. If that would be not enough, they would ask another 14 letters and so on. Uh, and then they, they get a corporate domain name and they check, okay, is it a ministry of justice? Uh, looks like that. Okay, so we move to the second stage of the infection, for example. 
Uh, those queries were built like here. So first in the hosting part, there were encoded data, uh, then uh, some subdomain names suggesting it is just some public cloud, like, you know, Europe West one region, and then a uh, main domain name, which was avsvmcloud.com, which could be treated as a lookalike for, for example, AWS uh, vmcloud.com. So the, the query was supposed to look unsuspicious. Uh, delay between queries here, it was extremely long. I mean, they use something like a few minutes between each and the other query. Sometimes it could be even two hours. And in some cases, if there was some failure in the communication, they would wait even, you know, six, nine hours. So really, really um, big delays between the queries. Uh, in the encoded data, apart from the internal domain name, uh, there could be an information about uh, uh, status of some security solutions. So they check if the endpoint is running CrowdStrike or FireEye or something like that, and they get the status of these uh, um, solutions. Uh, also, in every query, there was this unique identifier. So there was a Mac of this PC, of this host, basically, sorry, uh, the name of it and uh, global unique identifier. Uh, altogether, this encoded data part had 30 characters. So quite similar to the, to the previous advanced uh, case. They try to build queries which are not too long. So if you are looking for extremely long queries in your security system, that's good, but here it would not work. Uh, all this, uh, uh, this data part was encoded using base 32 algorithm with custom alphabet. So they didn't use a standard base 32 encoding uh, algorithm. Quite interesting case was also DNS reply. So the answer from the C2 server or let's say task assignment from the C2 server, like give me another 14 characters or give me security solution status or move to the next C2 stage. It was sent in form of IP addresses. So basically infected host ask about an array record and in the reply, he gets an IP address. This IP address meant those specific tasks such as send me rest of the domain name, send me security statuses, send me or, or move to the another stage. Those IP addresses were chosen from network ranges, sorry, of AWS, Microsoft, Google. So basically, if someone was observing this DNS traffic, he saw those queries looking like some public cloud queries with IP addresses as the answer. And those IP addresses were completely not suspicious because these were legitimate IP addresses of Amazon, Google, or Microsoft. So it was really quite, uh, quite clever approach. Another uh, approach how DNS is used by the attacker is to, uh, to download information from the C2 server into the uh, infected host. For example, malware could download additional malicious modules. Uh, this is the case of invisible malware, which was detected um, by ESET in uh, some diplomatic and military uh, sector uh, organizations in, in our region of Europe. Uh, and here DNS was exactly used to, to, to do that. So basically, when they infected the host in uh, such organization, Mm, they knew that possibly this host might not have internet, direct internet connectivity. It might be in some isolated network segment, but very often defenders are forgetting that just blocking communication between this host and the internet is not enough. And if this host can send a query to local DNS server, this local DNS server will act as a proxy and uh, it will send a new query, build a new query based on that and send it to the internet. So finally, it can reach attacker's name server. Then the attacker's name server is sending DNS reply to the DNS resolver of the victim. And then, then this resolver is replying, sending this reply to the endpoint, which was infected. So basically there's actually bi-directional communication thanks to DNS capabilities. In those DNS records, they encoded new malicious modules. 
So how you do that? You basically take a, a malware module, you compress it, encode it uh, with some algorithm if it's needed. For example, if you want to store data in TXT record, you use Base64, for example. If you use null records, actually you don't need any encoding. You just can take executable, cut it into the pieces, put in different records in the DNS zone, and then the endpoint is asking about each and every record, um, concatenating it, decompressing, and it can run new malicious model. So that was the case here. Uh, let's move to the other techniques. How malware can actually get uh, domain name of the C2 server address. There are several options. It can be fixed in the malware, uh, but more interesting techniques are using some dynamic resolutions. Here we have an example, uh, Glubteba botnet, uh, how it is getting uh, domain name for C2. Actually, Glubteba is asking legitimate cryptocurrency servers, such as, such as blockchain.info, and asking about details of a cryptocurrency transaction. And in op return field, it is storing C2 domain name encrypted with uh, AS256. So this is the encrypted uh, data. And after decryption, you can see C2 uh, domain name. So later, uh, when it is contacting uh, C2 server, it knows which domain name to use. And here we have uh, some example communication C2 over DNS uh, as executed by. Group malware. Another interesting example is um, this case where attacker was first using um, uh, DNS over HTTPS to bypass local uh, DNS system. So it is sending DOH queries um, directly to dnsgoogle.com asking to resolve a specific domain name. Uh, when we look at this domain in dmarkjquerypdates.com, uh, we could notice that in the reply, this is a TXT record, and it looks like a DKIM record uh, with RSA key, right? That's the first impression. But actually, if you know DMARC and DKIM uh, protocol, you know that it's not the correct name for the DMARC domain name, and definitely it's not the correct content. It's not the correct name for domain keys. Uh, domain name also. So basically, it just look quite similar, but it's not. And if we would take this, uh, this data here uh, and go again into the cyber chef, we can notice that this data is actually not a key, but each slash is actually delimiter. Uh, and if you take, for example, this string here, uh, you should decode it with base64 once and then decode it with base64 twice and then something interesting will <laughs> will show up. Let me just show you how does it uh, look like. So okay. Let's see if we clean that. So this is uh, the record. Let's do by 64 decoding. URL safe as usual. Um, and then let's remove that. So here we can see that this is actually another base64 uh, encoded text. So let's do again base64. And this is actually a digit, uh, uh, a number, a 32-bit integer number. And if we would uh, just, you know, use ping to decode it, you can see that actually this is an IP address. So it is just stored in 32-bit integer format. So in this record, actually, we have several IP addresses of command and control server. Here is the one, another one, another one. Uh, everywhere where you see this 9PQ, it's a double equal sign encoded in base64, there is an IPv4 address. So very interesting uh, case as well. Uh, another technique which attackers are using uh, is DGA algorithm, so they can um, basically, instead of fixing a domain name for C2, 
The malware contains small mal small code, which will generate uh, a lot of uh, random uh, domain names. It can generate like hundreds of thousand domain names per day. And um, attackers uh, register for a specific day just one of these domain names. So when the malware is uh, will successfully infect a computer, it will generate first domain name, try to re resolve it. If it's not existing, not existing domain name here we have, it will generate another one, not existent, generate another one. If he will be lucky to hit the domain name registered by uh, registered by the attacker, then uh, the bot will receive an IP address of command and control server, and then C2 communication can start. If this domain name will be blocked by someone, like a firewall, DNS firewall, whatever, then basically malware will generate another domain name and another and another and another until it will uh, hit the, the, the one which attackers has registered. So basically it makes blocking domain names much harder because every time you block one, the another one is generated. Here attackers are using random characters, digits, letters to build such domain names. In more advanced attack, they are using whole words to build domain name because uh, it's quite easy to actually detect such domain names. Uh, you are using different algorithms to do that. Like, you know, you check n-gram distribution, vowel ratio, uh, entropy, and so on. And you can detect such strange domain names. But if the attacker will build C2 domain name out of words, it's, a, it's, 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 much, it's much harder. So for example, here, here malware has two dictionaries built in. And whenever a malware tries to generate a domain name, it will randomly select a word from this dictionary, from the other dictionary, connect it, and then it will build domain names such as this ones. So they look completely, uh, you know, normal, I would say, right? So this is much more difficult technique to detect, but also it's actually possible. Let's move to some uh, simple things. Uh, so how about lookalike domain names? Uh, why they are used? So basically, it's used in uh, usually in some phishing campaigns, but not only. And uh, they try to build domain name which will look familiar to the user. Uh, if they try to target some brands, such as here we have a Netflix phishing, uh, Netflix targeting phishing uh, from Poland, we can see that the, the malicious domain name, uh, the whole domain name to here, uh, contains actually partially contains a good domain name, Netflix.pl. So for some users, they might not notice it's not netflix.pl, but actually it's some other domain, name, right? So it's a simple lookalike domain name. Could be more advanced. For example, some letters could be used which look like the other letters. For example, here, uh, targeted brand was InPost, which is a logistics company and a logistics delivery company. Uh, and here attackers were uh, have registered domain name lnpost.pl because uh, lowercase l looks like in capital I, so exactly like in the brand name, right? There is in capital I as a first. Uh, but actually, this domain name on the left, this website on the left, uh, is malicious. It looks similar. The domain name looks similar. But actually, when you look in the HTML code, you can see that the, all the credentials you enter are actually exfiltrated to malicious server. Uh, last year in Poland, for example, we, ca we, we, we saw a lot of com campaigns uh, which were using uh, lookalike domain names in composition with advertisements on Google or Facebook. And here, have, here you have some examples. Uh, why they do that? Because some users, when they enter the bank web page, they don't put a bank your uh, address in the URL bar, but instead they put bank name in the Google search bar. And then they click the first link because usually it's their bank. But here actually attackers bought uh, ad uh, campaigns. And here, if you enter, uh, for example, targeted bank name like Getting Bank or SGB, the first link is actually malicious one. The other one is a good one, but the first one is malicious. Here it can be easily seen because the URL is not correct. But in the other campaign, they actually got smarter and the ad name was containing good URL, uh, but it was linked 
linked to the malicious uh, URL. Here we have similar campaign, but in the Facebook, uh, Pekao Bank was targeted, and here is a lookalike domain name, and here uh, advertisement. Special variation of a lookalikes um, use special characters. We call this technique IDN from international domain name homographs. So the domain names which look quite similar by using quite similar characters to, to the Latin characters, but different. And here we have an example, adobe.com uh, with a special B sign uh, dot under it. Here we have uh, uh, SMS phishing uh, targeting lot Polish airlines saying that, you know, you can get two free tickets, just click here. And we have uh, lot.com, but the O here has a dot under it. In some communicators such as what, WhatsApp, this is also underlined. So this dot is barely visible. Uh, there are also some cases like this one. So look carefully. Do you see any difference in these domain names? Because if yes, then basically you need to visit the doctor. There is no, no graphical uh, difference. But actually, these are two different domain names. First one is built using Cyrillic character set. Uh, in Cyrillic character set, the Latin characters are repeated, but under different codes. So you can build a domain name which will look exactly like the you know, legitimate one, but it will be completely different domain name. In this case, this here would be seen in the ENS system as this one. Also, you know, in, in browsers uh, right now, if you put such, such domain name like this or this or this in the web browser, the browser will show you this uh, Punicode uh, name. So a specially encoded name. In uh, Outlook, uh, unfortunately, it's different. So if you will get such email with such domain names, they will be shown exactly like attackers wants. The only um, good thing which happened is that if you click such link in uh, newest versions of Outlook, Outlook will show you a warning that possibly you are going to some other place that you wanted. Not very clear message, but at least there is some, some warning. And uh, finally, uh, some simpler case, uh, SMS phishing with lookalike domain name. So we see uh, this domain name here. It was targeting uh, Czech Post. There was an SMS sent uh, asking you to pay some additional money for the package and asking you to pay this money under this uh, link. Uh, this domain name was a uh, domain name uh, registered two days before the attack. So as you see, the creation date of the domain name was September 5th. The first query was seen just 10 minutes after registration, but actually the campaign, the phishing campaign started on September 7th. Um, it was quite interesting because when you click this page, you see this uh, page to enter credit card data information. It's in Czech language. When you click uh, pay, then the other page is shown. And here we notice an uh, interesting mistake done by attackers because the text here is actually not written in Czech language. Here on the left, you have a Google translate of this sentence. We have now sent a one-time call to your mobile phone. This first one is a Czech, second is in Slovakian, third is in Slovenian. So you can notice this is exactly the same. So here, actually attackers did mistake and they were targeting Czech Republic. The first page was in Czech, but the second one they forget uh, to translate. So it was used probably from the previous phishing campaigns in Slovenia. So they, they left it. Uh, on Virus Total, uh, this domain name did not have a big number of detections. So during the campaign, it was actually zero. Uh, at the evening after the campaign, there was six seven detections yeah but one very really powerful technique to block such campaigns is to block uh, newly observed domain names in your networks so basically you can block uh, you can block your users from accessing domain names which were registered in last let's say three days or which were first seen on the internet in last three uh, days 
we did some uh, measurements with uh, my friend uh, from France, Nicolas, and he checked how much time it takes from a newly observed domain name, which is malicious one, to get into the thread feed. And in different vendors, it was more or less between 30 to 50 hours. The median time in uh, many IOCs we checked and many vendors, it was 43 hours. So basically when you block fresh domain names, uh, you are getting additional 43 hours on average of protection. So very good technique on the defense, uh, defense side. So key takeaways for today, please remember that DNS for the attacker is just a method of sending and receiving some data. That could be anything. That could be C2 server address, but as well, it could be a list of tasks to execute. It could be malicious code sent to the infected endpoint. It could be sensitive data exfiltrated out of the network. Second, DNS resolvers function as a proxy. So wherever you have isolated segment in your network, make sure you also check that DNS queries cannot go out from this segment. And the third thing to remember that, you know, DNS traffic is really well monitored not to mention protected, uh, and that's why attackers are using it. So it's basically uh, good to have a look at it. So thank you for today. I'm available in the, uh, in the chat. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to put it in the chat. Thank you and goodbye.